So we don't use GFCIs everywhere in the kitchen. That would be too expensive. So. Hey, so if you've been tracking with us on this project, we've roughed in the kitchen. We've trimmed out the lights, previous video here, and now we're gonna install the GFCIs. GFCIs are like one of the most nuisance, yet important items, electrical items in your entire home. So let's get it right. If you're a homeowner, this is the number one thing that I come out to fix for you when you've DIY'd it. Before we jump into this GFCI installation, let's take a look at our tools and materials. For this job, I purchased a Hubble GFCI. Hubble is very proud of their work and so am I. I want the best that I can buy. If you buy an off-brand, like a smart electrician, master electrician stuff, uh, you're gonna get what you pay for. The last thing I wanna do is roll out and replace the GFCI under warranty because I didn't wanna spend the extra $4. I want safety and reliability. This is one of the most significant safety devices in the entire home. It protects personnel from electricity and water. Fantastic GFCI. Not all GFCIs are gonna come with plates. This one does, and for that, flathead screwdriver. However, today, I have a customer-selected screwless wall plate. It's a good look. And for that, I'm using a number one Phillips. There are screws underneath that plate. I've got my wire strippers, of course. I've got a number one Robertson, or square drive screwdriver, which is what almost all electrical devices are compatible with. You can use Phillips, you can use flathead, but that Robertson is a perfect fit. I have a non-contact voltage detector to verify the work before I get started. And when you're finished, you have to have a means of testing your work. You could be walking away from an unknown hazard. So I've got my client plug-in tester. This thing will give me the voltage readout. It'll test the GFCI with that trip function. Beautiful. I've also got a Kiwitz tester that I'm excited about trying. It's always fun to try new gadgets. And this is the first time that I will have opened this up. Now, I love the fact that there's a case. Sometimes cases are sold separately. I feel like that's pretty cheap. Thank you for the case. Save that for later in case I get stuck. Now, you don't have to have a digital multimeter. You do have to have a way to verify your work, but it doesn't have to be something this involves. Man, it's super lightweight. Looks like a smartphone. Mm, I, like the, uh, I like the look and feel. Feels like I could drop it off a ladder, you know what? It's light enough, it feels like it does not have batteries. And in fact, I see batteries here. Thanks guys. And a set of test leads. Perfect, as you would expect. Oops, come on. And looks like maybe a temperature probe. So happy for that. Manual, temperature probe, batteries. Let's rip into these and fire this thing up. I'm, I'm antsy. It looks like it's totally auto ranging across all the different functions. That is really unique as opposed to selecting. Hmm. Auto power off. 10,000 counts. CE. Okay. It's got a uh, flashlight. I like that. Just enough to take the edge off. I do greatly prefer the right angle plugs. So I'm thankful they sent those. DC, huh? Select. AC. It's got Hertz, milliamps, true RMS. It's got a hold button. All right, put this to work. I do typically like having the longer exposed probe. So I'm gonna default to that position. Put the extra hardware in here. And I'm curious about these probe ports having four. So let's take a look at that real quick. So we took about 10 minutes to figure out what's going on with the Kai Eats. And uh, I like it. I'm gonna use it for this job. I don't feel the need to pull out my Klein. You see, I, I'd say Fluke innovated. Klein, probably, best guess, copied what Fluke was doing. And Kai Eats came up with something that was totally different. But I don't dislike it. It's extremely compact. It's got non-contact voltage detection built in, which I love. Absolutely love that. Look at that. Low, high, audible indicator, visual indicator. Like that's a really nice feature. I'm proud of you guys. So let's use it. Auto shut off, flashlight. It's got basically everything. I just have to become proficient in a new kind of uh, topology. 
So we're confident that our GFCI is dead. Let's throw this in the wall. So jumping into this GFCI over here, and uh, we did already test it. It is in fact de-energized. What you've got is an insert here. You're not gonna be wrapping your screw, your, your wire around your screw. You're actually gonna be plugging it in. So there's your strip gauge. It says it, strip gauge right there. It's about three quarters of an inch. Line side is the incoming power. In this case, I've only got incoming power and no outgoing. I marked on the rough end before the walls were up exactly where the GFCIs were located. And here it says hot and white. It's funny, it doesn't say black and white, but anyways, your, your brass goes to your hot conductor, which is typically gonna be black. You want a full engagement without any exposed conductor. Number one, square drive snugs it down to about 15 inch pounds. You wanna give, give all your connections a wiggle once they're done. Make sure nothing's gonna back out. The tug test is key. Pay attention to your GFCI because it will have individual instructions. I've seen GFCIs where line and load are right and left. I've seen them where they're top and bottom. You never ever know. It's brand specific. Ground is the same way. You kinda have to turn it upside down, get that plate to wiggle out of there and then fully insert that ground. You don't want it just barely poking under there. You want a full engagement. What I like to do is tuck, not stuff, tuck, not stuff my wires back into the box. So I get a nice seat. I'm gonna be consistent. In this case, grounds on bottom, but being consistent with what's already in the house and what's going in the kitchen. If my box isn't flush to the finished surface, then I'm gonna be required to use a box extender in most cases. The code is specific about that. And before I get too far, I'm gonna open my screwless plate and make sure it goes on once the GFCI is fully seated and not before. It's got an orientation, top and bottom, and in fact it does. So let's finish this out. Take care to put my GFCI in a true vertical. So it's not slightly off. If you don't have a good trained eyeball, then put a level on that. Dial it in. No excuses. Couple of turns, take it easy. It's This is easy to strip out. A nice flush fit. Okay. Now if I was being really picky here, there's a slight coloration difference. I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but this is a little bit more off-white and that's kind of this brilliant pure white. All right, so we turn the power on and pushing the reset button. Boom, turn tester power on. Let's just test this a couple different ways. So plug in, I've got 125 volts AC, which is great. It says correct, which means we're wired correctly. I'm gonna push the GFCI test button. Boom, zeros out, exactly what I expected. One nice thing about the Klein, it does, does retain the original reading. Reset, okay. Let's see what Kai Weeds has for us. This is a tamper resistant outlet so it's hard to get probes in there and there's no GFCI test function to my knowledge. So be careful, as soon as you insert those probes, they're gonna be live and you can get shocked across there. Okay, oh, auto ranging takes over, 125.1 volts, 60 hertz on the money. I like it, let's push in a little further, make it stay, carefully push the test function and good performance by the Kiwitz. We're back on. Hey, sometimes those test buttons are really tough. In fact, you've got to take a screwdriver and like push on it because it's so rigid. Just an FYI. We're gonna do one more GFCI with load side. Check it out. All right, if you want much more details on GFCI, check out our video here. See, on the rough end, we marked our line side conductors with this piece of black tape and capped them off because that breaker has landed just in case it went live, someone flipping through circuits trying to find something. I'm not gonna unpackage my screwless plate because this gets a backsplash. So that's gonna be stashed in the kitchen drawer for the homeowner or the contractor later. If you're wondering what this is, that's our under cabinet lights. I'll show you how to do that next. Use your 12 gauge strip hole three quarters of an inch or follow the strip gauge on your GFCI. Check and make sure 
the circuit is in fact de-energized. And then one thing that's unique here is we're going to be utilizing a connector called a crimp sleeve. You can buy these at any home store or electrical supply house. You can also use green wire nuts or standard wire nuts to make a pigtail. Along with my crimp sleeve, I'm going to be introducing the diagonal crimping cutting pliers. See that jaw right there? Utilize that. A most aggressive and dynamic jaw to crimp that down and give it just shy of a death grip. Oh. <clears throat> That's it. Now one thing I've got to interject at this time is you see I'm working off a drop cloth. Always, always, always. If a homeowner walks into the house and they see that you've got a metal tool sitting on their countertops, regardless of how old or how new or how expensive, they're going to suddenly take a keen interest, a suspiciously keen interest in taking a look at the countertops and they're gonna see things they've never seen before because they've never inspected their countertops with a level of suspicion that you've now just induced into them. So you've gotta protect the countertops. In fact, some granite countertops are mined off river bottoms in Brazil. They dam up rivers, stop the flow of water, excavate and mine granite off the bottom cut it into slabs, ship it here, and you're at like 150, 200 bucks a square foot. Please, drop cloths. All right, so now I'm gonna cut off one of my two grounding conductors. They're properly connected with a mechanical connection. That's code language. If you accidentally reverse line and load hot or neutral conductors, the GFCI will not function. Depending on what you do, it either won't reset or it will trip under conditions of use. I like to terminate my line side. Come back, double check, load, load side. Load side terminals are tightened down. So you've got to loosen them up first. Slide the conductor in there, hold it with your thumb. Come back and give it a snug. And that is line and load. All right, last thing to note is I've got an adjustable box here. So I'm backing it out of the wall by turning it lefty loosey. And that's gonna allow the tiler to get a good clean finish to the box simply by making adjustments. It's beautiful. Let's uh, turn it on and give it a test. All right, three, two, one. Boom, oh, there it is. Amazing. All right, hit the reset. That looks good, red light goes away. Turn the tester on, 127. So we don't use GFCIs everywhere in the kitchen, that would be too expensive. So we use standard outlets. This standard outlet must be GFCI protected and as many of you know, it is. It's being fed from a GFCI receptacle that's got downstream protection. That's what the load side is that we were talking about. And I'm gonna show you one more thing. This gets tile backsplash too. So I'm gonna use a box extender, slip it over the top uh, of this receptacle. And then I'm gonna slip these spacers. They come in strips like this. You can break them off in twosies, threesies, foursies, whatever you need. And I'm gonna put it right there, slip it on my screw, and that is what's gonna firmly secure, come on, my receptacle and my box extender, and there it is. Get the top prepped, get the bottom prepped, and then tighten it all up at once. Man, when your general contractors see you going through the, the paces and getting it just right, man, they go crazy. They love that stuff. They want quality, they want professionalism, and it's hard to find in trades. It honestly is. It's hard to find. Make sure it's dead nuts, up and down, back to the GFCIs. It's that simple. So this is what it looks like when a receptacle is protected downstream from a GFCI. You can see it's powered up, 126 volts. Push the test, boom, did you hear that? It clicked out over there at the GFCI. So this is what you encounter all the time. I failed to put an adjustable box in at this location, back it all the way out, and of course the box got substantially covered by the cabinets. If you're an estimator, you've got a plan 
for contingency. You've got to have a 10 to 15 percent contingency baked into all of your estimates because you will use it. The customer's going to throw something at you, and if you start change ordering that little kinds of stuff, man, they're going to be frustrated. You've got to plan for it. If you're an optimist, you're going to be burned. Requirement: Always check and make sure your power's off. Slide that box extender over there. Whoop and into place, that's a good fit. I've got much longer screws on deck from my stuff box. So once I get this all tucked in there, I feel like a plumber right now. <clears throat> it's always the case with these box extenders. There's so much in the way you end up flying blind trying to get the screws in. My box extender was hanging up on the side of the box, which is why I wasn't able to make progress. Hey, thanks to Kiweeds for this tester. It's gonna find a place in my standard carry and I'm looking forward to using it in again based upon its diverse functionality. GFCIs are a wrap and you might be wondering what this little guy is here. That is low voltage DC under cabinet lighting and that's next. Check out the entire playlist for the whole kitchen project and subscribe to Electric Pro Academy for real skills to make real money.